All right, everybody, thanks for joining. This is Carol from the Society of the Th of Thoracic Surgeons Adult Cardiac Surgery Database monthly webinar and today, is September 6th. On the line with me, we have Melinda Offer, our STS Adult Cardiac Consultant, and Sydney Clinton, our public reporting uh, guru. A few updates from STS, and then Melinda has some wonderful education for us on um, risk factor, the risk factors immunocompromised present and cancer within five years. We will have polling uh, with that. September training manual has been posted, Harvest Three Data is an analysis that closed on August 18th, I think it was, and AQO registration is open. Please make sure if you are having any difficulty registering, please make sure to get in there and register for AQO if you're having any problems. Um, reach out to me and I'll put you in contact with our meetings team. I, gu I guess we had a few issues last week with um, folks trying to register and they were not able to do that. So please make sure uh, if you are attending AQO, we're three weeks out, get your registration in so we can um, we can save a virtual spot for you. Not there's any limitations, but just, you know. Important dates, um, today's September 6th, it's the monthly webinar. We have a quality improvement series webinar on September 20th, and we will have uh, one of our uh, seasoned data managers present from her, her hospital on a quality improvement project that led to a manuscript on decreasing vent times. It will be a very good, uh, very good webinar to attend if you're able to, otherwise it'll be recorded. September 26th through the 29th is AQO. Again, that's virtual this year. Next year, we are planning a live AQO with limited seating. Um, this year is September 26th through the 29th. Adult cardiac will be on September 28th, Thursday, September 28th, and it is going to be a good one. You can purchase AQO if you're not able to attend that day. All of the um, meetings are recorded and will be posted for you to watch. I, you, we usually try to keep those up um, for quite a few months after AQO. Um, you won't be able to get credit for CEUs. I think the CEUs cred credits usually end within a month or two of the end of AQO, um, but you will be able to watch that content if you purchase it and aren't able to attend on this day. So please, if you are able to attend, um, to purchase the content, you can get reimbursement from your hospital or um, if your surgeon's office reimburses for anything, um, please try to join us. Very great content and we'd love to have you. Again, we're three weeks out. I have more slides on that in a second. And then I also want to highlight want to highlight this monthly webinar that's coming on October 4th. Um, we are going to present a topic on beta block beta blockers, preoperative and postoperative beta blockers. Uh, I strongly encourage everybody that can to attend this webinar. We will have um, a couple of our anesthesiologist folks on here, um, some research folks and some of our other surgeon leadership from the STS discussing beta blockade. We are um, looking to start a new project in the STS adult cardiac database that we're going to explain uh, in detail on this webinar. So I highly encourage you, it will be voluntary, but highly encourage your attendance um, to the October 4th webinar to see what this is all about. And, um, and hopefully you're able to participate. Um, it won't take much of your time, and it will really mean a lot to the um, community for cardiac surgery patients. Um, so please make sure you mark that on your calendar, October 4th at 2 p.m. Central Time. Um, all right, we're at Harvest 4, which closes on November 10th, so a couple months away yet. And by that time, our leaves should all have been changed colors, except for those in the south. So getting there. Again, AQO September 26th through the 29th. It's virtual next year. We are looking to have it live in person with limited uh, seating available. Our day for adult cardiac will be Thursday, September 28th. And registration is open. Please be sure you register. One day non-member is $250. And I'm telling you, it's well worth that for the content um, that you'll receive as long as the ability to claim um, continuing education credits. All right, I just want to make sure I didn't miss any. 
I think we're waiting to hear back. Usually we offer some somewhere between 15, 15 and 20 CEUs. Um, please don't quote me on that. We're waiting to hear back from the company. They're evaluating our uh, program right now. And then we'll have more information posted on the website regarding number of CEUs available for the adult cardiac track. Usually it's right around 15, I think, um, but please don't quote me. And um, Sydney is answering Elizabeth's question. All right, I'm gonna shut down the chat box here. I had no idea that there was a Sepsis Alliance Summit that same time. And I apologize um, for the uh, overlap in dates for both of those meetings. AQO, if you purchase the content, it will be available to you. And we usually try to keep it up for at least six months. Sometimes I think last year we kept it up almost the whole year um, for you to go back and watch. So please um, don't hesitate to purchase AQO just because it overlaps with an, another meeting. You will have the opportunity to watch it, um, all of the content. And also for those of you who cannot attend AQO on the day, we will plan um, something to what we did last year for AQO was a hot topics webinar. So after AQO, I think we're going to plan this for early in December. We'll have a webinar for all of those who purchase the AQO content. Uh, we'll have a webinar with um, the surgeon speakers, data manager speakers, and the topics that um, were the most interesting to the AQO attendees, to you all, um, the ones that sparked the most questions, or if we need to come back and clarify anything, or even just elaborate on education, get more granular with information, uh, we'll present that on AQO or on a Hot Topics webinar. That webinar will be, uh, I'm thinking, probably the first or second week in December, and it's usually a four to five hour uh, Zoom webinar, just like we're doing right now. Um, I'll invite different speakers back from AQO. They'll present and they'll be available for questions and answers. So if you are not able to attend the virtual meeting, you purchase the content, you can, and but you're still able to join for the AQO Hot Topics. You'll still have the availability um, to ask questions live, get get answers back live, or um, have discussions with the with the presenters. So that is not uh, lost in this virtual meeting. And so just keep that in mind. And I think I covered it. Melinda, anything I missed that you can think of before we hand before I hand it over to you? Oh, thanks. So except I just want to I do want to reiterate that the IQO um, agenda is, is I think it's going to be pretty awesome this year. We've got a a lot yeah, of really see. good a lot of really good speakers and um i've seen most of the presentations already because we've all been working on them uh for the last several weeks and um, i think we have a lot of scenario sessions this year um i think it's Let's just gonna be really fabulous let me see if i can find the if we have any um agenda posted yet oh okay, the agenda ah. click the link whoops so thursday is intermix we do have uh, the option to purchase a one-day pass or an everyday pass um, if you purchase the everyday pass you get access to all the content for all of our databases um, intermix pdmax a adult congenital and general thoracic um, the first day is dedicated and all of the material will be recorded and go back and watch the content whenever uh, you want and we'll have these hot topic the hot topics webinars um, we will have the hot topics webinar um, for all of the databases likely the first a couple weeks of december so Thursday, uh, Tuesday is Intermax PDMAX. This is the VAD, the Ventricular Assist Device uh, Registry. So we'll have great presentations on that. Wednesday is General Thoracic. Go over some lung anesophageal case scenarios. And then adult cardiac, here's the exciting part. Um, Dr. Namesh Desai will be talking about the up and coming aortic risk model, which we've been hearing about um, for, for 
uh, quite a while. And um, we hope to have a good update from him on that uh, by this time. The ACSD updated risk calculator, Dr. Robert Habib from the STS Research and Analytics Center will be um, presenting on this and available to answer questions um, during this 10 minute presentation. These are, this is a panel discussion, these first four. The multi uh, procedural composite, which is coming out in the multi valve composite. So these are all new risk models or updates to risk calculators that we'll be discussing. And then we'll have a panel discussion with um, doctors Desai, Habib, and Jacobs. And then we'll have Dr. Uh, Weiler von Ballus present on a project that he's working on, which is the frailty project, and um, discuss with um, what the status is of that project and future projections of how that is going to move forward within the database. And um, that will be an important meeting to attend. And we will invite Dr. Moritz back, uh, Dr. Weiler von Balmus back to talk further on this topic on upcoming webinars. Um, uh, present the Dorothy Latham Poster Award. For those of you who have been around um, for a while, Dorothy was one of our um, lead core group members. She became the consultant um, to the STS and she ran the FAQ mailbox. Um, Dorothy, Dorothy passed away a few years ago and um, she was her whole life was dedicated to the quality improvement for cardiac surgery patients. Uh, she was a great, um, great person to work with, a great friend, and we have an award that's dedicated to her. Um, and so we'll be, the posters that have been accepted for will be um, reviewed by you all on the platform, on the meeting platform. And these are uh, usually scientific or quality improvement type posters. You'll review these, you'll vote for your favorite, and then that person will be awarded the 2023 Dorothy Latham Poster Award. We'll go over Carpentier classification with Dr. Weiler von Balmus and um, case scenarios. Melinda's going to do some PROC ID case scenarios. Dr. Whitman, whom we all love and adore, will talk about uh, deep sternal wound infections and stroke. If you haven't had a chance to hear Dr. Whitman talk, uh, I would join. I would pay two hundred and fifty dollars just for ten minutes of his time, just for the enjoyment that he brings into my life. Right, Melinda? <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, I think you'll you would enjoy his uh, presentation on deep sternal wounds and strokes and. Um, Amy Geltz will be presenting case scenarios along with Kim Miraglio. Um, Nancy Honeycutt, and these are all um, core group members. We've worked really close together. Um, we know them well, and they are um, super dedicated to the database. Nancy Honeycutt's going to present on a ORTA case scenarios encoding. Matali Mahantrakar will present on perfusion case scenarios. Uh, Don Huey, Dr. Huey will present on maze procedures. And if you all remember from last year, the Hot Topics webinar, um, she actually had a heart model where she went through some of the uh, maze procedures and uh, the incision uh, sites and talked about how the incision sites are made and how we're coded and things like that. So she'll work along with Callie Carroll um, on some case scenarios and we'll adjourn. Uh, the times listed here are, I believe we're all Eastern time. So we start at 11 Eastern in the morning, which is 10, 9, 8 Pacific time. That's why we have to start so late Eastern time. Um, so it'll go <laughs> from 11 in the morning Eastern time, 8 Pacific time um, to 6.30 p.m. Eastern time, which is 3.30 Pacific time. And look at the on-demand comment content because I think it's going to be really good this year. Yeah, this is um, this is wonderful. So the, we'll have Dr. Jeff, Dr. Jacobs uh, will present on the PROC ID chart, the idea behind the PROC ID chart, uh, what it's intended for. And you saw up above, Melinda will be doing case scenarios for that PROC ID chart. Um, Karen Kim will be talking about the aorta. She'll do an, an anatomy session on the aorta. She's done one. Um, for the last couple years, every year, it's wonderful. Every year we get great feedback um, and it just gets better and better um, with her presentations. Matali Madrakar, um, she will be talking about perfusion. And I think uh, this is kind of the, the starter, the kind of the theory, if you want to do like a theory and 
action class, if you will, I guess. She's more of a theory. Uh, this is a theory perspective of perfusion. So what what are we doing with this? Why are we collecting it? How do we collect it? And then she, up uh, in her live presentation on perfusion, she will be giving case scenarios. There she is. Um, so this these all are on-demand content. These that are listed here on demand content. We highly encourage you watch these before AQO, um, before the actual uh, presentations, because we will um, these will give you a good background for what the case scenarios are going going to be. They usually are available a week before, a week prior to AQO. So, uh, Cindy Spears will be presenting on concurrent data collection benefits, tips, strategies. So I look forward to that. Cindy's a um, a very well rounded data data collection specialist. I think that's what I'm going to start calling us data collection specialist. And um, I look forward to that presentation to hear her uh, to hear her ideas on how she does things to keep it uh, well organized at her site. How to utilize IQ of your reporting by Heather Hompior and then TVT registry. Dr. Joe Bavaria will be giving us the update from the TVT registry. Dr. Horvath will continue his talk that he presented last year on registry reimbursement. Um, this is an important talk if you're interested in learning about how the registry data is used for determining reimbursement rates and um, what's what's coming down the line. Sometimes we have um, data managers who are also involved in other aspects at their hospital that find this talk very helpful. And then Dr. Jacobs will be presenting on star ratings, the background of star ratings, why they were developed, how they were developed, and what what's what happens with them. This variation in perioperative beta blocker use and new onset atrial fib after isolated cabbage, a prospective study within the ACSD. This is the talk that will be live on October 4th. Uh, it will not be at AQO. We'll, we're moving this to a live webinar so we could have a, a larger attendance. Um, usually we only get about maybe a third of the data managers if that attend AQO. So we really uh, want to push this topic. And so we're going to move that to a live webinar uh, where you'll have that opportunity to ask and get questions answered. Um, and I think that's it. Did I do good, Melinda? Did I highlight mm -hmm. it good? Yeah, um, like I said, I think it's going to be great. We certainly put a lot of work into it, so yeah, well it's a, rounded. It's very, it's a very content um, dense. I think it's it's going to be good. So, a couple of questions. Uh, when did you say the beta black webinar was? That will be on October fourth, um, October fourth, two p.m. Central Time. CEUs will be off. Will not be offered for the hot topics webinar. They will be offered for the ACSD for all of the um, AQO content, the on-demand and the live sessions, they will not be offered for the Hot Topics webinar. Will on-demand, when will on-demand sessions be able, um, be available to view? Usually we open that up a week prior and we send out emails letting attendees know that that will be, that they're available and it's open. So, Carol, is the Hot Topics webinar only available for those who register? That was a yeah, question. Yeah, that's right. It's only available to those who register. Um, if you only have one person register at your site, then um, they have to have somebody pass along that information or uh, figure out a way to be sneaky. I don't know. I don't condone that. But just, right, Melinda? Just gather together in a room all together. Yeah. <laughs> just don't. I, that's what I, I mean. <laughs> I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna shut up now before I get fired. Okay, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Okay. All right. Um, so I, let's do this. Let's do some education, I guess. Uh, hold on. Wait. One. The CEUs will be available on demand for the on-demand sessions as well. Single day does include the on-demand content. When will AQ on demand? Oh, the week prior to the um, live AQO. Are there any plans to move to a new version in the near future? No, there's no plans right now for a version upgrade. Okay. Where are you seeing those questions at? Are they in the chat box or in the Q&A? In the Q&A, there was 12 yeah. of them. My, I don't even see any in my Q&A box. That's crazy. I can't see the questions. Do you have open and answered in the dismiss tab? 
Yep, but I see no questions. <laughs> That's wild. Okay. That's okay. Do you see Michelle Guilfoyle's question? No, I see nothing except it says, it says how do oh how do we use spirometry results in chronic lung disease? Thank you. So I'll let you um do your education and then I'll pull up we can do <laughs> yeah. Michelle. We can start with Michelle's question for the clinical side. I don't know why I can't see him. Okay, all right. So we're going to continue um, moving through the risk factors. And this month we're focusing on um, immunocompromised and cancer within five years. So again, as you probably have all figured out, both of these are in the risk model and both of them were audit fields in 2022. Next slide. All right, so we're going to start going through the questions and we'll do the polling and hopefully by the end of the presentation, we will have all learned something together. So question number one, the patient has a medical history of immune thrombocytopenic period, ITP, and received IVIG daily 518 through 521 prior to surgery. Is this abstracted as yes to immunocompromised? Any answer? Uh, A is yes. Hold on, wait, I'm getting there. Hold on. B is no. Okay. I apologize for my yawning. <sighs> See, we, I started it. I'm sorry, you, Melinda. Carol started yawning. it. Let me give you, uh, make you co-host with me here. There you go. Is the poll running? The poll's running, and I'm going to shut down the chat box. I can't Can see. Can you see it, Melinda? No. Can't see anything. I can't see the poll. I can't see the you and I. What the heck is going on? Oh, well, I'm going to end the poll because we got pretty good response. I can't believe uh, you can't see it. I can't see it. I didn't see that one. Okay, can you All see right. that I just ended it? No. Can you see the results? Nope. Have another I'm sorry. <laughs> have another computer <laughs> open somewhere? Oh, no, I don't know what's going on. This is All right, bizarre. so I'll tell you, we had uh, 213 folks responded out of the 355. 72% said option A or yes, and 28 said option B or no. Great. And the answer is oh. A. Oh. The answer is A. Yes. This is a considered immunocompromised. Um, and is actually an example in the training manual, this specific yeah, question. So it is. Are you there. in full screen, Melinda? I don't know. Let me see. All options. Uh yeah. Oh, gosh, grandma. Think so. Q and A. I still see no questions. This can is too weird. Your, can you move your screen around? And you're not in full screen. Yeah, I can move my screen around, so I'm not in full screen. Thanks, Heather, for the suggestion. <laughs> Yeah, okay. now she just needs to tell Melinda how to get it in full screen. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, can you see the webinar? It says uh, we're on answer one. The answer was yes. I can see that. I can see the answer. Okay. What am I doing here? I don't know. We'll just, oh, I see full screen. There we go. Let's see if this will work. Okay, next question then. Sorry guys, technical difficulties today. Question number two, patient has a history of chronic hepatitis B and takes into the car daily. Does this classify as immunosuppressed due to, due to the medication and the hep B? A is yes, B is no. Can you see the new poll? No, it's all right. I, I can't see them. Do you have one or two screens? I have two screens open, but I always do. Do you see the poll button? Uh-huh. Is it open? What if you click on polls? It says, how do you code this? AV repair unplanned or, 
or it's different Paul it's not for this oh. uh, let's see if I can yeah it's IMAs what's going on I don't know okay well we're at I'm going to stop the poll there we have 197 folks unless then I'll give you a few more seconds I see answers coming in and I could tell you right now Melinda it's a 40 60 split oh wow well yeah this is this can be a little confusing okay let's I'm going to end the poll now and we had 39 percent of the people responding said yes 61 said no okay and the answer is dun, 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 no okay so this, this medication, Entifacar, is actually an antiviral medication. So it's not an, am, an immunosuppressant medication. And then when you look at the Hep B, that's not considered an immunocompromised condition because we're going to be coding that hepatitis B in sequence 485, which is liver disease. Um, one thing I do want to point out is when you see medications that you don't know, and you think, oh, I wonder if this is an immunosuppressant. I always Google. <laughs> I look it up and read about it to look, and I look to see what the drug category is. That's the key. Is this is this an immunosuppressant? Is this a steroid? Is this a, a medication, a chemotherapeutic medication, or an anti-rejection medication? Medications that are listed in the training manual that will um be coded as such because there's all kinds of medications out there and we cannot we cannot certainly keep the entire list so this is a, just a good example of um, bringing this point up that google can be your friend and also looking at the drug class of the medication to see if uh, the uh, class is one of the classes that are in the training manual that we can use Okay, next slide. Question number three. Patient has a history of a partial splenectomy. Would I code yes to immunocompromised? Yes or no? Can you see anything now? Mm -mm. Hmm. I don't know what's going on, but I feel like a blind person. I know, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's not your fault. I wish I could help. It's okay. Okay. okay, answers are flowing in. It's uh, about a 70-30 split. Okay. Patient has a history of partial, okay. Partial gonna, splenectomy. Yeah, it's a good one. I think the, I think these uh, last stragglers are checking the training manual. <laughs> I'm ending it. <laughs> okay, so so what did we end up with? So we ended up with thirty, just about thirty percent said option A, and seventy percent said option B. All right, well, those seventy percent of the people were right because um, the answer is no. So if you've had a total splenectomy, you're considered immunocompromised. But people who have had a partial are not because when you have a partial you actually are preserving the immune system functioning that the spleen has. So the the good point here to remember is if you've had a full splenectomy, you're immunosuppressed. If you've had a partial, you're not. Thank you. Next question. Question number four. Patient receiving radiation for prostate cancer. The patient is no, on no other treatment. Do you code yes to immunocompromised? So he's just having radiation for his prostate cancer. Is he Im immunosuppressed? I think they might have gotten this one, Melinda. It's uh, about 90, 10%, 90%, 10%. 90 yes? No. Or 90, 90 no. no. Oh, yeah. Very good. Very good. The answer to this question is. Hold on, it's still going. <sighs> now nobody know. else is. Nobody's going to answer what I just said. I shouldn't have said anything. <laughs> I my big mouth shut. 
All right, I'm gonna do it. Ready? Yep, I'm ready. Okay. So, um, thirteen percent of the folks said option A, and eighty-seven mm percent -hmm. said option B. And those eighty-seven percent of the people are correct. So, in the training menu, we had this update actually in January of this year. So if you're just receiving radiation therapy only, you're not considered immunocompromised. And that's what this patient was receiving. Okay. Next question. Question number five. Patient, patient, patient takes Plaquenil every day for rheumatoid arthritis. Can this be considered immunocompromised? Yes or no? So they have rheumatoid arthritis and they're taking Plaquenil every day for this condition. Answers are flowing in. It's a good split, but I'm not going to tell you which way because I don't want to ruin it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't want to ruin the surprise for everybody. Okay, let it run for just a few more seconds here. Get your answers in. Okay, I'm going to end the poll. Now, 73% uh, said option A, 27 said B. All righty. And the answer is A, yes. And this was actually just updated, but I, I've actually been sending this answer out to people for quite some time when they send me the questions. It's basically the same concept. The, the rheumatoid arthritis is an immune disease, much like lupus. It is also being treated with the Plaquenil one every day. So if you have lupus and you're getting Plaquenil one every day, or if you have rheumatoid arthritis and you're taking Plaquenil one every day, they're both considered immunosuppressed. Thank you, Melinda, for the good information. You're welcome. Okay. And next one. Question number six. Patient is a weightlifter who admits to using long-term injections of anabolic steroids. Is this abstracted as yes to immunosuppress? So he's a weightlifter. He's taken anabolic steroids. Is he immune suppressed or not? That's a good question. I know. People send me great questions. Get great questions in the mailbox. And I apologize if I'm a little slow these days answering some of the questions, but AQO is, is, uh, is taking a lot of my time. So, um, you got a nice split on this one. Okay. got nice attendance on today's webinar 365 people wonderful yeah that's great okay i'm gonna end the poll now so uh for yes 28 percent of the people said yes and 72 percent said no melinda very good 72 percent of people have been reading their training manual because and the answer is? is no. We actually <laughs> made this update um, last year, April 2022. Um, do not include topical steroid applications, one-time systemic therapy, inhaled steroids, pre-procedure protocols, steroidal back or knee injections, or anabolic steroids in as immunosuppressed. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay. Number seven. number seven. Uncontrolled diabetes is classified as a secondary immunodeficiency. Since uncontrolled diabetes fits this classification, should we code this condition if explicitly documented in the patient record as immunocompromised? So, the, so this person, they're, they're saying that they've got uncontrolled diabetes and um, it's documented that they are um, having some secondary immunodeficiency. So would we code this patient as immunosuppressed or not? I feel like I'm taking my nursing boards all over again. 
right. <laughs> oh, Melinda, the tricky one. <laughs> Well, All right. I, tr I tried. Did somebody just... really send this question in? I wonder if that person no, works. Somebody for, really, uh... somebody really did send this question in. I can't make something like this up. Okay. So, um, but the point of the these calls, I think, are to point out things that might be hidden in the training manual, even though they're there. You know, sometimes you just you're reading real fast and you don't like always see everything. So I try to pick out tidbits of information that would I find useful and uh, hopefully just to point things out that are in the training manual. But you were trying to be tricky. I was not really trying to be tricky. <laughs> All right. I'm going to add the meeting poll. Let's see. We have a, a, a 2080 split. 20% said option A, 80% said option B. All right. And the answer is option B, no. Okay, so in the even though this is documented um, and, you know, uncontrolled diabetes can have issues, definitely, there is a separate field for diabetes, and that's sequence 360, and that's where we will capture the diabetes risk factor. Um, so that's why... We, it would not be captured in this field. It has a special spot to be captured. Sneaky, sneaky, sneaky. Plus, That's they're not one. really, they're really not, it's not really considered an immune uh, disease either. You know, diabetes is diabetes, what can I say? Yeah, no it, ma no, it makes sense. And it makes sense that this goes along with the risk factor of diabetes, which is already captured, that you wouldn't want to code immunodeficiency in addition to. That makes sense. I'm going to go to the next slide. The next slide is similar to this one. Would immunocomplex from endocarditis be captured as yes to sequence 492? The patient is on no immunosuppressant medications, but the patient has active strep species endocarditis. And there's documentation that this patient has immunocomplex. So would we capture that as yes to immune suppressed or no? Good question. It's a great question from a data manager. I don't remember who sent it in, but it was uh, it's a very good question. Yeah. Okay, the answers are coming in. Let me give it a few more seconds. Go ahead and end the poll. Get your answers in here a few seconds. Okay. So it looks like 8% said option A, 92% said option B. All right. Option B is the correct answer. The answer is no. Again, endocarditis has is its own condition. It's got its own sequence where it's captured in sequence 385. Um, the patient was not on any immunosuppressant meds, and endocarditis in of, of itself is not an immune system disorder. So we would not capture it here, 492. Thanks, Melinda. Next I one. Yeah, I think we're moving into cancer now. Yeah, okay. So now get your cancer brains on. Okay, this is sequence 500. If a patient was diagnosed with prostate cancer, in 2017, had SBRT from July through September 2022, and then again this March 2023. He's currently taking Eligard. If the diagnosis was more than five years ago, but the treatment is continuing, would that be considered cancer within five years? So he's actively being treated for cancer. But he was diagnosed more than five years ago. Is this is this coded as cancer? Yes or no? And I'm and I'm sorry, uh, but just to clarify, S, SBRT—that's some type of radiation. 
mm -hmm. therapy? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But now he's taking Eligard for his treatment. And, uh... Okay, so he had radiation treatment from September, from July through September last year. And then again in March, he's taken Eligard. Current, his first diagnosis was 2017. And he's having surgery now, right? Mm -hmm. And he's still okay. being treated, still being treated for cancer. So do we code this as yes to cancer or no to cancer? Okay, let me relaunch it. Sorry if it didn't launch. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. It's funny, I can see the chat box, but I can't see the Q&A, that's crazy. That's all right, I'll read them too. There's not, um, there's not too many in there. Six right now. That's a good question. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. And the um, audience has responded. 82% says option A or yes, and 18% says option B or no. Oh, very good. The answer is A, which is yes, because the, the, the intent is to capture if the patient has cancer within five years of the procedure. So this patient is actively receiving treatment for cancer at the time of surgery. So we definitely would want to code this patient as having cancer. Um, because that's the that's the real intent. Don't let that diagnosis of five years like mess you up. Because the real intent, what the surgeons want to know is if this patient has had, had cancer within five years of the procedure. So if you're actively being treated for it, you still got it. Perfect. Thank you. And next question. Question number 10. I have a patient with a melanoma skin cancer. The doctor excises the melanoma in his office of April 2019. Do I capture melanoma as cancer in sequence 500? A is yes, B is no. So this is a melanoma, it's skin cancer. Um, it gets excised and um, it's in. It's within five years. Just assume that I didn't write it in the, in the question, but let's assume it is, okay? And uh, so would you code this as cancer? answers are coming and we do have a couple of hand raise um i don't know if you uh, julia crystal kim and then somebody with pf 48 and if you need your hand still raised keep it up otherwise um i don't know if you know how to put it down or not but there's a button okay i'm gonna go ahead and end the poll oh melinda uh -huh. So 66% said yes, and 34% said no. Oh, that's an interesting split. Okay. So the answer in this particular um, question is yes. So melanoma is not considered a low-grade skin cancer. Um, and that's the key here, because normally we would not capture a low-grade basal cell or squamous cell carcinoma, okay? Um, but melanoma is not one of those. And so we will capture melanoma in sequence 500 as, as cancer. And I actually took this to the surgeons just to verify, to make sure. And they assured me that this was not a low-grade basal cell or squamous cell carcinoma. So we should be capturing that. Right, myelodysplastic, I don't know where they come up with these names sometimes, but myelodysplastic syndrome, actively being treated, seen by heme on regularly. Should we code this as cancer? Yes or no? So that's, this is the MDS syndrome, I think. Um, so is this considered cancer? Yes or no? It's being treated, hemonc, seeing them. Hmm. I think everybody's as confused, Eris. 
are confused about? They're not confused. They're torn. The audience is torn. Torn. Yeah. They're torn. Yeah. Torn. Torn. Like, like a wet paper bag. <laughs> well, yeah, this, <laughs> this syndrome's not, you know, I don't know how common it is, but um, so some people may have never even encountered this in their practice yet to to have to ask themselves, oh, is this counted as cancer or not? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end it just so we can uh, keep moving. We got a good response rate. 56% said yes, 44% said no. Oh, wow. This Ooh, is going to be good the learning. Then. Is... The answer is yes. And because this is a, this is for the for the American Cancer Society, this is a, this is a cancer. It's a blood a blood cell type of cancer, so um, it is considered cancer. And it's actually in the training manual. We updated this. Um, thinking it was like yeah, May of two thousand twenty-two. It's actually there, so we'd be coded as cancer. Very good. Next question. 12. During cabbage, a biopsy of an enlarged parasternal lymph node was positive for metastatic poorly differentiated carcinoma. Do we code yes to cancer? So they're, you're having the cabbage, they do a biopsy, it comes back positive for um, metastatic carcinoma. Do we code this as yes to cancer? In sequence 500. These are really good questions that came in. No wonder why they came in the FAQ mailbox. <laughs> yes, yeah, they are good questions. Well, it makes me think, you know, we have to, as the data managers, it's not just learning about the database and what clinically, what, what the procedures are and things like that, but it's also knowing all of these other other things, I know. Other things, right? Like what falls into <laughs> cancer, what falls into immunosuppressed, what it's very, uh, very clinical. Mm -hmm. It is. It's it racks my brain. It racks my brain daily. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we're given, I don't think um, we give enough credit to that, you know, yeah. that you have to understand what all of these different cancers are, what all of these different drugs are and mm -hmm. have the patients to look things up. All right, I'm going to end the poll now. And 71% 70 per, said yes, and 29% said no. Okay, and the answer is yes. Um, and this is specified in the training manual. You can code yes for patients who are diagnosed intraoperatively because we know that that patient went in to surgery with this cancer. You just didn't develop the cancer, you know, um, Cancer takes a while to develop, so this patient clearly had cancer uh, prior to surgery um, since they did the biopsy and found that he had a carcinoma. So we can capture that as yes. Perfect. 13. If a patient has a cancer that is treated and was in remission, however, now within five years of surgery, he has a recurrence. Is this yes or no to sequence 500? So this is a patient that was in remission, but now within five years of surgery, he has a reoccurrence of the cancer. So does he have cancer or not? Yes or no? Okay, it looks like a good, good snapshot here. So 99% of the people said yes, 1% said no. Perfect. Because remember, the intent, the intent is whether this patient has cancer when they're going to surgery. And this patient, even though he was in remission, it's come back. So he, ha he does have cancer. So yes, we're going to say that he has cancer. 
because that's the real thing that the doctors want to know, you know, in this risk factor. Is this patient actively having cancer at the time of surgery? Or within five years of surgery? Okay. All right. Question number 14. I have a patient who has chronic lymphocytic leukemia. <laughs> oh my God, I've been on too many calls today. <laughs> chronic lymphocytic leukemia. <laughs> That was very, that was very oh. rhymey, Melinda, very <laughs> rhymey. I'm telling you, but it's not currently on medication for this. Can I code as cancer within five years? Yes or no? <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. It's been a long morning for me. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, still early, by, it's still early by you. I know, it's, it's not even one o'clock yet, but I feel like it's five o'clock. <laughs> oh. You need more coffee? <sighs> I need something. Mm -hmm. uh, Chronic lymphocytic lymphocytic <laughs> lymphocytic leukemia. That's a tongue tangler. Yeah. So he has chronic, he's got chronic leukemia, but he's not currently on medication. Do we code this as yes to cancer? That's another great question. Okay. I'm going to go ahead. We have um, 57 folks responded. 57% of the participants responded. I'm going to go ahead and end it. Get your answers in. Two. Okay. 86% of the participants said yes. 14% said no. Nope. Very good. The answer is yes. Um, so... We updated this in the training manual too. I think it was last year um, in April, the same time we put the um, MDS comment in. But this patient does have a chronic lymphocemia leukemia, meaning that this patient chronically has this cancerous condition. So we were going to capture yes for cancer in this particular population. Okay. All right. Oh, yes, we're it. done. We're well, done. Look at that. Somehow I was thinking I had 16 questions, but this worked out perfect. So we like have Christmas, some time. It's like Christmas, Hanukkah, and, <laughs> and Eid. Okay, we're going to go through all of the questions that we have coming in. Sometimes you can't see the four. Oh. <laughs> I can't, I can't <laughs> see it. <laughs> I can't how, see anything. <laughs> how do we use, um, we're going to go back to Michelle's question here. How do we use spirometry results in chronic lung disease? Well, I don't really know what that means exactly. So I'll tell you what I think it means. I, you can use bedside spirometry and it should have an FEV1 on it. Um, and you'll be able to use that. If that's not what you were looking for, Michelle, then send me a question in the mailbox. Okay. So. Um, SEM08 said, I always thought it was idiopathic uh, thrombocytopenia. Learn something new today. I don't know. I don't know what that was referring to. It was one of the earlier questions, I think. Oh, boy. Oh, I think it was the first question. It is is an ITP idiopathic? I thought so. Maybe I maybe I've missed something. We hit, it says immune thrombocytopenia. Four ninety two. Oh, for four ninety two. I think the key is they're getting the IV, the I, the IVIG. IVIG. Yeah, yeah, but I think we have this here. This oops, where it says the history of um, immune thrombocytopenia. I think it's supposed to be idiopathic. Not immune. Oh gosh, sorry. Okay, thank yeah, you. Thanks for thank you. We learned something new today. Okay, I have a patient with prostate cancer being treated with aplutamide. I think I said that right. It's an antineoplastic drug that belongs to a class called antiandrogen therapy. It's antineoplastic, but I don't see that it's immunocompromising. Would it be correct to mark this no? I think, Stacy, that's a great question to send into the FAQ mailbox and Melinda um, can research it um, yeah. to, to the full intent that needs to be researched. And then um, 
get an answer back to you. That That's best, especially because I have the ability to search the mailbox and so to see what answers we've answered in the past. So that's real helpful if I can do that before answering that off the cuff. Off the yes. top of my head. Lori says, sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees through the trees for life. It's a lot of our lives, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then Stacy also added, if a patient is currently on an antineoplastic drug for cancer, can we consider this to be cancer within five years? Well, if I, I would assume that if they're still taking treatment, that they still have cancer. Otherwise, why would they be taking treatment? I mean, just logically thinking through that. Yeah. Would you ever do prophylactic treatment if you're um, in remission oh. after five years? I don't, I don't oh. know. I don't think. I mean, I think once they're in remission, they don't get treatment. I, mean, I don't know. I guess we'd have to learn more about that situation. That seems like um, maybe it's not as black as clear as we think it is. Yeah, and I just want to let you know that Dia says that idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura is also called ITP, is also called immune thrombos uh, thrombocytopenic purpura. So oh, you are right God. as well, Melinda. Winky, Thanks, smiley, winky smiley face. Hey. Thank you. Yay. Okay. Um, here comes a question. It says, since hemoglobin A1C reflects blood sugar levels over the two to three months, what in hemoglobin A1C immediately post op or on uh, post op day one or two be a good indicator for diabetes as a risk? Question uh, mark. I don't think we can. I don't. I think we're pretty stringent about lab values being pre op. Yeah, I um, I would like though we um. I would ask that you send this in to the FAQ, Melinda. I'd like to talk to you about that one because I think. Um, I had a conversation with one of the surgeons mm -hmm. and a different project we're working on. And I just want to make sure we're, we're all in agreement. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I was pretty strong about the pre-op thing, but this one's a little bit different because it does measure it to over two to three months. So, And it could be and that, but I want to, I want to research the fact, you know, does anesthesia affect this? Does particular medication, any could anything, you know, that we may, or may not be giving the patient. The I totally is. agree with you. And it could even just be the the stress of surgery, right? I don't know. It, yeah, that so that's kind of like. Open A1C levels or not. Yeah, we have to research that one a little bit. Thank you. I'm, um, you know, send it into the FAQ mailbox. If you don't know how to do it, just let us know and I'll show you where to go. Um, Erica is saying, question regarding the newer Encompass a flip, a, a flip, <laughs> a fib ablation device. It is clear that this is a bipolar RF device, radio frequency device. However, what is unclear is what lesions are being created with the device. I have taken this to our surgeons and have been told that our current available options don't really capture the lesions created. The product website states it is used with minimal dissection and creates lesions around the pulmonary veins and the entire posterior wall of the left atrium without opening the atrium, all in a single pass through the transverse and oblique sinuses. How should we capture these lesions? And Melinda, I believe you and I actually. Well, I this think up, this, right? is this a convergent procedure? That's what it sounds the, like. Hold on. Let's, we might um, have to look. I don't want to take time on the call. But I thought I think, we looked something like this up, and I think that that sounds familiar. I, I Erica, send that in, but I'm thinking this this might be a convergent procedure. because you, You're talking about the posterior wall. and Oh, she says this. No, it's not convergent. Well, you better send it in, because we're going to have to look that one up. Yeah, because the PVI is quite often done in the convergent procedure these days. And so just send it, that one in, because... I'm not sure that it's not a convergent procedure. That we look this up, Melinda. Okay. All right, Erica, send it in, please. Um, Astube says recent studies show HIV patients with good CD4 count are considered as adding no risk 
to operative mortality. May you share share us your thoughts on that? Hmm. Um. Well, my question, my first thought would be, is the patient receiving any medication um, on this study? The patient say study where they receiving any kind of medication for the HIV at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd like to see the study. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar with that uh, study. So it would be something worth looking at probably could send that to me that would be great yeah great thank you um hillary is admitting that she was the one percent who caused us to not re achieve a hundred percent in the question where we had 99 percent right and one person got it wrong that was hillary everybody and she apologizes she read the question wrong so we can oh, all man. laugh with her and not add her <laughs> <laughs> thanks hillary for coming out with that <laughs> <laughs> Poor uh, Hillary. Not a, uh, not a question. Uh, this is from Heather. Not a question. It's my first time one. It's my first time on here as I'm new to the database. Thank you so much. This has been amazing. Twice a month, Heather. Join us twice a month. We always have something good. Um, thanks for joining. I'm glad you're able to join. Jackie, there are some long, yeah, and Jackie and Sherry uh, Center have it said the same thing. There are some long-term breast cancer drugs, um, prophylactic meds for over 10 years. Um, tamoxifen is taken long-term for breast cancer that's in remission. So those are, that's maybe something we can cover in the um, training manual as an update or something, Melinda. Well, if I guess I think we're talking about two different things. I mean, are we talking about cancer or are we talking about immunosuppressant drugs? Because... If the cancer is in remission, then we wouldn't we wouldn't code it if it's in remission. We wouldn't code cancer if the cancer is in remission, if it hadn't been within five years. Yeah, I think the question was, though, about the medications. The tamoxifen is not a, is, I know oh. I've answered this question. And it's it's anti, not, not an anti-neoplastic? No, it's not. It's something else, anti-estrogen or something like that. I can't remember exactly. So, okay. um but yeah, because I've answered that question quite a bit about tamoxifen. It's not counted in 492. Yeah, that makes sense then. Thank you. Um, Beth, Stacy, and Darlene all are confirming that that is not a convergent procedure. It's done in open surgery. Mm -hmm. um, with convergent is an Episense device, which is unipolar, encompasses bipolar PVI and posterior wall. Mm. They um, we can look into this, Darlene, and, and provide some clarification on how to code it. Her surgeons are suggesting a way, but we just want to make sure um, our the STS surgeon leadership um, is a, in agreement with that. So thanks for the suggestion. Thank you, Beth and Stacy, as well. Yeah, send it in. Send in what your surgeons are suggesting, too, because I know we talked a little bit about... Erica's on it. She's sending it in right now. We talked a little bit thanks, about Erica. this, I think... Was it last AQO? There was a question about this or something. I don't remember, but I don't know if Dr. Huey is going to address this or not um, this year. So I need to get all that information and then I can reach out to Dawn and, and ask her, are you, are you including this? So, um, so we can talk about that. Okay. Okay. Next thing I have uh, two things. And then I guess we could probably hop off. We're six minutes over. Um, hello, and thank you both for making this so fun. You're welcome, Julia. <laughs> Just wanted to know where I go to get the September training manual. So let's see what we have here. I know it's up. It is. Gabby told me she put it up. So. All right. So sts.org. I have to, I'm not going to be able to log in because I have, um, I have issues with my thing for some reason. Well, I can tell them where to go to. If you just see that research and research and data tab. Yeah, it's, this guy. it's this for guy. the data managers right there. Go into four data managers. And about halfway down here, you see adult cardiac surgery database. 
and you click there's click on that access data and it's going to ask you to log in I can't this uh, this is where I get stuck in a loop I have to Carol, log in the other Carol, way Carol lost all her rights because she's you know yeah <laughs> so I got she in can't trouble get in so now I can't even get she in can't get in anymore but you log in and when you log in, you're going to see the resources in for version 4.2. And the first thing that pops up is the training manual and the FAQ summary. If I can get in this other way. I have the back way to get in, but sometimes it doesn't let me do that either. But that's where you go. Log in here. You'll scroll down to see 4.2. Oh, no. See, I just, I just go in a loop. It, it's going to confuse you if I keep doing it. So I'm not going to keep doing it. But I think you get it. I have. A... This is my other one. Let me see. Here. I don't know why they won't let you in, Carol. Oh, here <laughs> I got it. I had to go the other know. way. I have a, a secret. I have a secret login. So adult cardiac surgery database, access data collection resources. And then this will, see, I didn't have to log in this way because I, so I adult know. cardiac surgery 4.2. And then there's the training manual from September. Okay, hope that helps, Julia. What about patients who are taking PARP inhibitors? Are those considered immunocompromised? What did what is the question? What kind of inhibitors? What about P, P A R P all caps? Part P A R P. I don't even. I'm never. I'm not sure. I know what those are. Better um, send it in, Glace. <laughs> send it in so we can research it. <laughs> I'm not. I've not seen that question come through. So it might be something we need to research. Y'all didn't realize my job was so much research. It's, it's a, a lot, lot of research. research. It's a lot yeah. of research. So. When you, you have to be inquisitive things, to love that job. Yeah, when I ask you for things, it's it's a lot of times it's because I just I'm trying to figure out what, what what's the best way to um answer this and how to handle this. So I appreciate all your patience with all my questions because I know I ask lots of questions of you. So that's because she's inquisitive and that's good. <laughs> that's what we want. Okay, Mary says, Thank you. I learned so much each time. I appreciate you guys putting these. Q and A, the Q and A together. Melinda does most of the hard work. I just bring the laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> well, personally, I think I'm funny, but you don't have to think I'm funny. Okay, April says, I am interested how you will code the encompass lesions as well. We use this product often at our facility and we are currently coding it as posterior box lesion only. We will get some clarification on that. Um, I'm curious too. I'm curious too how we should code it. Oh boy, so. here we go. <laughs> She's going to be up till three o'clock in the morning Googling. <laughs> it would be wonderful to have the training manual as an easier access than what it currently is. Yeah, unfortunately, it has to be behind a um, protected spot. So I guess, uh, you know, you just where you're just going to have to access it. Sorry, it's so difficult. You know, I. I, you know, what I do is I access it and I download it once a month. Yeah, the yeah. updated ones and just save it in a, um, just save it in a folder. That's what I do. I just, you know, and that way I don't have to access it every day. I mean, to look at it, I can yeah. I just have it downloaded. And then Stacey says you can save it as a bookmark too. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. Um, sometimes you need to clear your cache to see no newly posted updates. Yeah, my problem is I just can't log in. They, they blocked me, STS blocked me this way, but I have to, because I have to go the other way. <sighs> I know sometimes it won't <sighs> let me in because of my cash. Sometimes, yeah. it, and, and that's horrible because I'm trying to do my job and I can't get in. So, yeah. <sighs> Can, I know, right? <sighs> Can you explain why the incision to open the atrium to perform cryo is considered a cut and sew and cryo method. <laughs> that's because that's how the surgeon said to do it. Uh, yeah. Isn't that we, right, Melinda? Basically, we, we went back and forth and back and forth. And, and historically, we would have never coded that, okay? Historically. But uh, thoughts, thought patterns have changed. 
and we have the ability to um, multi-select. So we can multi-select cut and sew and cryo. And um, this actually was a question that originated in AQO last year, if you can believe it. And it took me that long to, get it, resolved, <laughs> to get it resolved. And um, that was the resolution that we would be cutting, we would be coding it as a cut and sew and a cryo because we have the ability to select both of those fields. I know that for some of you who have been in the I database. I think it's also, did they say something about it's also not just solely cryo and it's also not just a cut and sew. So we wanted to capture all of it. Yeah, we wanted to capture it both, but but historically, and and this is probably from somebody that's been around as long as me, we would have never captured this as a cut and sew. But the, like I said, things change um, and thought processes change and um and surgeon leadership changes. So, um, and uh, so that's why we had that update because, um, like also I said, it was a posterior box lesion, right? No, it was for the um, go up further, up, up, up to the cry up, up to the cut and sew, the different types of lesions. There it is, right there. Um, so it's just it's just a new it's just a new update it's a new thought oh. process and, and i know what else we didn't have multi-select fields we could only choose one right in the we previous didn't version have multi-select fields yeah. before we also had different thought processes and you know, sometimes things change and this is just what the surgeons decided to do so this is what this is what we're going with so thank you and then um michelle provided a little bit more information on the I don't know if it's PARP inhibitors or if you say it P-A-R-P, -P, it's brand new to me. Um, PARP inhibitors have a side effect of decreased red blood cell, white blood cell, and platelets. So Melinda's hmm. going to Melinda's going to uh, investigate that one too, along with Encompass. Yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah, along with all my other AQF stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ah, and then Michelle uh, Michelle adds in uh, Encompass uses a clamp. Yeah, I know. I've 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 heard about the I, people send me these op notes about this encompass, and I tell you what, the surgeons don't document what they do. They just say they do six lesions or seven lesions or something, and they don't they don't document. So there's no description in, in the notes that I've seen. So yeah. I can't I can't help you if there's no documentation of of what was done. It was just basically what I tell people. You know, you've got to talk to your surgeon about what he's doing if he's just telling you he's doing six lesions. And there's no description of it. Um, yeah. So I'll see if, if if you guys have some good op notes where the surgeon does describe what they're doing, then I think we could probably get a better handle on it. Okay. And um, Kim, thanks, Melinda. Kim, I, your hand's been up. Kim Poland, your hand's been up. So I unmuted or I allowed you to talk. You just have to unmute if you have something to say. And um, same thing for Diana Contreras. Uh, feel free to to jump in here with us. We're probably going to start wrapping things up. So thanks everybody to for joining. Kim, Diana, if you're there, feel free to say hi. Okay, not hearing anything, so I'm going to assume you just raised your hand up just as like a permanent hi. Okay, all right, everybody. Thanks for joining, Melinda. Um, thank you so much. Erica, please send the questions regarding the Encompass into Melinda with all your details so she can bring that to the surgeons. Diana, Sense, and uh, Cyrus, thank you so much for joining. Same thing, Lucretia, thank you. And everybody have a great rest of the day. Melinda, anything else? No, it's just um, the next time we'll, we're going to have a, a risk. We, we'll skip the one in October because we're doing the beta blocker, but we'll start back up again with more risk factors in uh November. In November, gonna... yep. And please join October 4th webinar. Everybody's invited. And I do hope to see you all at AQO. Um, be sure to register, get your registration in and join us. It'll be fun. I promise. Melinda and I are going to moderate for the whole day. So <laughs> and, <laughs> we'll and, have a Car blast. and Carol's going to say all the hard names. 
yeah, for me. I'll say our hard names. And I'll... <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna practice ahead of time. All right. Thanks everybody so much. Please have a great rest of the day and, and be safe. Thank you, Melinda, as always, and thanks Sydney for joining. Um, take care. Bye.